So this was the day after my crazy seven and a half hour run down to Montefalco. I was kind of wiped out. I got a ride with Omero Moretti back to Montemolino this morning. And then uh, Danilo actually had to go down to Rome to visit his distributor. So I had a gap of time and I figured I'd use it to try and visit Papucci down in Todi. Uh, Filippo didn't know I was coming and I didn't bother calling him or anything. I figured, screw it, I might as well just jump in the Abarth, drive down there. Even if it doesn't work out, it would be an opportunity to drive around, see more of Umbria, have a good time, you know. I mean, look at that in the Abarth. Uh, I got there, he was meeting with some people from Hong Kong, so I just hung out outside overlooking the vineyards for a while. It was pretty awesome. So this is the hilltop. So that's the is that that's the original Cantina Pepucci. That's the monastery. Was the monastery this is down the there? The old monastery of Sant'Antimo that was built around 1000 by Benedictine monks, uh, where my family moved to live late in the 80s. Yeah, they okay, restored the 80s. it all completely because in the 50s was finally abandoned by the farmers that moved to live there after the monks. Okay. They invest 10 years of restoring the house and then their passion for the place and the, and the fact that they discovered it's lovely for wines and vineyards pushed them to enlarge all the property and then implant these 30, actually in 13 hectares of new vineyards that we carefully selected uh, using native varieties like Sangiovese, Sagrantino and the Grechetto di Todi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also a little bit of the international varieties that we use for uh, Giovanni. You taste it. I hope yeah. you find it interesting. Yeah. Allora. So welcome guys. Uh, I'm in Umbria. Who is uh, making this video is in Umbria. You are not in Umbria, but I try to feel you as in Umbria explaining my wines that in some sense is made to push you to feel as you are in Umbria. This wine uh, I just served to my guests from Stockholm are Petro Roquattro, Todi Rosso Doc, that uh, in that vintage 2015 is made using 60% 60 uh, 60 of Sangiovese grape that is fermented completely in stainless steel uh, tank and then aged in a uh, bottle. In the main why we added it uh, with some Sagrantino grape, another native variety of Umbria, that give us the chance to and, and increase a little bit the shoulder of the Sangiovese, giving a, a little bit uh, fruity notes of the wine. And then the rest is a little bit of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Uh, but that that wine show completely the the, the taste, the flavors of the two top and Sangiovese and Sagrantino variety I used to complete it. Yeah. It's all all fermented and uh, in stainless steel tank and then aged shortly, six to eight months in bottle. Mm. This wine is a fresh red wine that we created thinking to, uh, to a wine could be used every day with different meal. Uh, I think wine, it's something that never ends, because it's always that the, the wine at the end is a continuous research yeah. of something different and different and different wines. And this is why in my wines there is constantly a research of the uniqueness of the variety I grow, because I think I have to maintain it, because it's something new that the market could discover and that I'm guaranteeing that it's... Uh, keep going on. In the past I feel that we are losing this and then the world of wine is becoming flat, becoming flat in the winemaking process, in the research of the oaky notes in the wine and we know that in Nava and Sonoma they don't use oak but they want the taste and the spicy of the oak so they put a piece of oak in it. It was crazy. Shoveling in oak chips, yeah. <laughs> I never, I never, never use my oak to give something and to add something. I use up the Cabernet, the Sagrantino cause. Why? Because the tannins. And the tannins is something that disturbs you if you drink it. So if I want to make a wine that is drinkable with Sagrantino or Cabernet, I need to round it. And the only way, it's hook. What? Not spice. I don't need nothing. The flavors, the taste come from a juice. It's like to have to respect an apple that gives me taste because the something that I put all around the apple is the apple. And the grape juice is the taste. The oak is helpful. The market 
Kush has to believe that it's the, the Barik. So in the 80s, we, we, we live this, this nightmare and we keep going on and someone researched the Oki notes uh, mm. and they put chips in it. So it's like to prepare... Uh, it's, it's not the way I, I live my no. kind of uh, life. Uh, spicy left by the age of the, of the aging in oak. Mm -hmm. And then all the fruity notes uh, comes out. So really, we are close to the top of the experience that this mm -hmm. wine can give us. So what is 2009 compared with uh, eight and uh, other years? Which years have been the best here in the past? We have a nice, nice <coughs> feedback uh, from the 2007 vintage and then the 10. Yeah. 2010 was lovely also in Umbria. We had uh, a cold season. Mm -hmm. Not rainy, but cold, so we maintain very high acidity, so we have a great freshness. Uh, and this wine, obviously wines that need to be, uh, that we need to wait. Yeah, obviously, it's a great help to maintain a very high acidic shoulder, mm -hmm. that is the freshness that you have back also in 2009. Mm -hmm. eh? So that wine also is very fresh. Drinking it, uh, you don't feel you're drinking a wine that uh, 2009, 2017. Eh? Mm -hmm. No, it's close to be good. ten years old. It's mm -hmm. eight years. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's not a baby, but it's fresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very fresh. So in 2010 we have more. So we expect also a wine that could be aged for a longer time. Uh, obviously, my history is quite short. So. I, I never, never been completely happy of my vintages. I'm drinking my wines, I always found out something wrong, mm -hmm. and I think that this is the way to keep going on and improve, you know? Mm -hmm. My wines is <coughs> never good enough or the best ones I can produce. No? How old are the grape uh, stocks? I mean, the, the grapes, uh, the, the plant? The vines. The yeah. wines, how old are they? When were they planted, these grapes? So, the start of the implantings was uh, happened in uh, 2002, and mm -hmm. then we completed all with the last two hectares of Crequeto and Sagrantino in 2007. So, that, but we had uh, vineyards of 2002. Yeah. 2015 was extremely warm, but nothing compared with 2017. Vintage that really was a, I, I would say, a catastrophe because we lose the 60% of the total production. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, for example, I don't release and produce any L'Altro Io 2017, any Giovanni. Probably, probably, we will produce a unique wine on that vintage, a pure Sangiovese. Mm. Uh, we had good. Good proof <coughs> back from the Grechetto in this vintage. It was it was the heat. It was the lack the lack of rain over the summer. Uh, that, that I think it was the lack the of rain, absence, yeah. absolute absence of. Water. It was it wasn't it wasn't hail or anything like that. No, it was no, just, it nothing. Was the, nothing. It was, it was the drought. Extremely extremely warm, only ten to fifteen days in July. But really, we came from a very very uh, dry winter. Yeah, and also. I really remember exactly the, the first day it rains in some sense uh, co consistently. It was the 24th of July. Right. This is where Filippo grew up. Uh, his parents, his father had been an architect. And back in the 80s, they got fed up with living in the city, bought this, this abandoned thousand-year-old Benedictine monastery yeah, out in totally. super rural Umbria, the moved out here and rebuilt it. Yeah. Like the building didn't even have a roof on it when they bought it. It was totally falling apart. So they the completely Apenines renovated it, uh, restored even, there this thousand-year-old Benedictine kind of chapel. So after we had checked out there. the winery, Filippo wanted to bring me down here to see this. I was just tasting wines with a couple from um, stock. Romanic uh, uh, chapel of the medieval we maintain in Umbria and one of the best uh, restored 
best restored and then it's part of this monastery that was built around 1000 by Benedictine monks and then my family renew it completely uh, since the moment they bought it late in the 80s and then they left the property and they used to implant the vineyards all around. Uh, it's classically uh, split it in two, the inferior church and the superior church. And it's very nice because we have some letters brought by the Archbishop of Todi to the farmers that uh, pray them to took off cheeses and wines from the crypta. Ah. <laughs> it's very fresh, their cellar. <laughs> and then unfortunately the fresco was destroyed by some, uh, some intruders in the 70s. We have some pictures and it was a lovely fresco that uh, represents St. Sebastian. Okay. And then we have the pictures, but also we have the sign of the arrow that uh, yeah. eats some oh, yeah. stuff. And, and yes, you see all the arcs, it's bigger and bigger and bigger to create a, a prospective effect, you know, from yeah. that one that is smaller. Oh, I bigger. see. Yeah. So you have the feelings that it's the so same. So you go from a smaller to a larger. image that is made one eight to nine hundred years larger. ago. Okay. Yeah. The engineer is quite good, pretty good. And I'm not saying I'm not a monk. 